happy to say that out of all the economists I've listened to, and I've listened to a lot, uh, Kevin has a, the ability to translate things into bite-sized chunks that everyone understands. So I jokingly said he's a bit like, uh, he's got the charm of George Clooney, he's got the foresight of Nostradamus, and he's got the intellect of Sir Isaac Newton. So let's see if he lives up to the expectation. <laughs> Without uh, setting him up, uh, we welcome Kevin. The main thing that's been disturbing the world economy is a trade dispute between the U.S. and China. Now, if it was a trade dispute between South Africa and Namibia, I don't think anybody would really care. I'm not sure it would make the newspaper. But because it's the trade dispute between the U.S. and China, it's been on the front page and it's had a massive influence on the world economy during the course of last year and it's still having an effect, okay? Because it's the two biggest economies in the world. And I'm going to show you what that effect looks like in terms of uh, world trade. So this is what's happened to the growth in world trade. And I'm hoping you can kind of see the change. So world trade was growing at roughly 4%, maybe 5% at times, if you look back, right? That's the volume of growth in world trade measured year on year. And that's impressive. That means that the world is doing business uh, with one another. There's a degree of globalization going on. And when that happens, the world economy feels better. The trade dispute started. Trump caused uh, the trouble. He started the dispute. Look, I think he had a legitimate issue. I think that uh, China doesn't play fair. I think China was given uh, preferential access to the US. Uh, it was an unfair trade relationship in favor of China. So China was benefiting. The problem was that uh, Trump decided to negotiate the trade agreement via Twitter. And it turns out that's not the best way to negotiate. Uh, and it caused quite a lot of uh, ructions in global trade, putting up trade duties, imposing trade duties on one another. And a typical escalation of trade. Obviously, it's not in favor of, um, it's in favor of Trump. Uh, but he wanted, and the nature of the deal should help the US over China. But hopefully, it starts to ease some of the tension. So what is the nature of the deal? Uh, essentially, what the US said was, we'll reduce our import duties on some of the goods we buy from you. How much? About $120 billion small portion of the duties. We'll reduce the duties. <coughs> I didn't even notice that. It's slipping down. 14% to 7.5%. Uh, and that's all the U.S. agreed to do, to drop duties on some of the goods. On the rest of the goods, the duties remain in place, 25%. So they didn't really give up much. What did China give up? China said that over the next two years, they will buy $200 billion more of U.S. goods uh, as an import into China, which represents an increase of 50%. In other words, China agreed to buy 50% more goods from the U.S. over the next two years. And in addition, they are going to have to look at a whole range of business practices in China that have been unfair. Things like copyright, patent laws, protection of... Uh, information, all kinds of things that they've been doing badly, uh, where you allow counterfeit goods, all of that stuff they've got to clean up. So there's a lot uh, that China has agreed to, very little that the U.S. has agreed to, and so there is now a trade agreement. And I'm hoping that that trade agreement leads to a improvement in global trade and therefore an easing off of some of the trade pressure. Okay, so that's the main thing going on, and it seems to be getting better. So where does that leave the world? The world economy you would describe as being, okay, it's fine, it's steady, it's solid. You wouldn't say it's robust, you wouldn't say it's phenomenal, you wouldn't say it is accelerating, you would say it is okay. Now, what gives the, the world this resilience? What is making the world economy this resilient? And you can focus in on one factor, and it's a bizarre factor when you think about it, and that factor is U.S. shopping. As long as the U.S. consumer keeps shopping, the world economy does okay. That is bizarre. Why does it matter? 
because U.S. shopping is that big. So think about this statistic. U.S. consumer spending is bigger than the entire China economy. U.S. consumer spending. I don't know, I'm just happy to have the job. The guy doesn't give you those big benefits. You don't think you can demand it, you 70 years old, and so the guy employs you. Plus, you don't have to talk to him about, so where do you see yourself in five years' time? <laughs> guy could be dead. It's all changed, right? It's all changed. Is this good for the U.S. economy? Is it good for economy to employ 70-year-olds, not 35-year-olds? Is it a good thing? It's good if you're 70. Is it good for the economy? No. Why is it not good for the economy? Because the 35-year-old, when he gets a shiny new job, he wants all the goodies. He wants a new house, a new car. He upgrades. And he spends a lot of money upgrading and he uses credit. And the economy booms. When the 70-year-old gets a new job, he worries about the cost of parking at the shopping center. <laughs> not so. So don't get the boom. But it does change how businesses are functioning. Have you, ever, have you ever employed somebody 70 years and older in South Africa? Have you ever interviewed somebody? <laughs> have you heard of somebody going for an interview that's 70 years and older? Can you see the difference in dynamic? And that's the fastest growing age group in the U.S. It's all changed. Okay, so the U.S. consumers got a job. There are lots of jobs. They've been employed. Those people who want to work can get a job. And as a result, they're super confident. Consumer confidence pretty much at a record high. Broad-based across all income categories, across all aspects of households. They're super confident, and on top of that, they're the wealthiest they've ever been. U.S. household wealth measured after debt is now $110 trillion. Phenomenal increase since the financial crisis, especially if you own a house or if you've been invested. House prices are now back at an all-time record high. The stock market's done exceptionally well. If you've got a pension, you've got a house, you've got a job, you are thrilled. You just don't want Trump. Yeah. Or you want Trump. And because of that, what's happening to the U.S. economy? It is shopping. And because that represents a bigger portion of the world than the entire Chinese system, the U.S. economy is doing well. And where do they buy all these goods that they buy, that they spend the money on? Where do they get those goods from? A lot of those are imported from around the world, not just China, everywhere. They're suddenly going to put up interest rates and say, ooh, this is too much, In inflation's out of control, I've got to put up interest rates. In fact, they've been cutting interest rates. Inflation, there is no inflation to worry about. They target 2% in talking to cut more taxes. Trump wants to win the next election. One way to try and get to win the next election, besides blowing up Iran or something like that, is maybe cut some taxes. So you could get a tax cut. You could get an interest rate cut. You're the wealthiest you've ever been. You've got a job. So there's no more money left. Very difficult to spend money you don't have. The government's tried. But it eventually will run out. But it's your second option. How do you spend money? Government. Your third option. Can you develop the infrastructure of your country? Now in South Africa, the infrastructure, at least the business infrastructure, is governed by the SOEs. What is business infrastructure? Roads, railways, harbors, airports. That's business infrastructure. Electricity. Those are determined by the SOEs in this country. So if you want to drive growth, you've got to improve the infrastructure. That's always a good option. The problem is the SOEs are bankrupt. Can they drive infrastructure? No, they don't have money. Fourth option, we could all go shopping more. That would be nice, eh? It would be fun for a while. I think, look, personally, I think you guys could shop more. And when I say shopping, I'm not talking clicks. Eh? I'm talking proper shopping. Okay. With the bag, not just the shoes. The bag and the shoes. Okay, matching. 
So many economies around the world are quite prosperous simply because their consumers shop. The U.S. does very well out of shopping. And you could say, oh, it's just shopping. It's a key part of how we function. And for many countries, it's a key, key part of how they're successful. Singapore. Have you been to Singapore? One big shop. It does very well out of shopping. Could South Africa shop? The small problem with us shopping more is we don't have any money. Our income is dried up. So it's no longer an option. And then the last option is business could invest more. Business can decide, look, let's, uh, let's build a new business. Let's build a factory. Let's do some research and development. Let's upgrade our technology. All of that would be investment. Could the business do that in this country? Yes. Have they got the expertise? Yes. Have they got the money? Yes. yes. They've got the money. So what are they lacking? Confidence. They're just very unhappy. Those are the five drivers. You've got to get one of them working if you want the growth rate above 1%. Which one would you go for? If you were Cyril, which one would you try and fix? Hey, I would go with the last one. I think it would be the easiest and it would show the best benefit. Which one is government going for? Any idea? Everything else. No, not quite. They're going for SOEs and government finance. Will it work? No. I did my presentation and during my presentation I put up a particular chart. And when I put up that chart it was confirmed the audience was hostile. And the audience started shouting things, mostly abuse. And I don't think the abuse was directed at me. That's what I tell my psychologist and she kind of agrees. <laughs> what chart do you think I put up that turned the audience hostile? By hostile, I mean people standing up, vocalizing <laughs> their views. Eventually, the minister, deputy minister of finance had to tell everybody to quieten down so that we could carry on. What chart do you think I put up? No. Not government spending either. They know that. Which chart do you think I put up turned the audience hostile? No, 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 no. In your mind, when you see this chart, and you see that chart in racial terms, you're not going to sign up to make that happy. No matter what people say. If you see that as non-racial, if you see that as just business, then you're probably going to sign up and say, let's make these guys happy, let's get them engaged. Our problem is that we see too many things in racial terms. And we make decisions with race fully in mind. It turns out economies do not prosper when decisions are made on a racial basis. Ask the National Party. Economies prosper when you make good decisions irrespective of race. The best decision to make now would be to use this balance sheet. So in every country, you only have three balance sheets. Three balance sheets, that's it. And you want to grow your economy, you need a balance sheet. You can't grow your economy on hope, on a wish. You need capital, a balance sheet. What are the three balance sheets in every country? Three balance sheets. Your, your government balance sheet. It's normally big. And if it's in good shape, it can help. Our government balance sheet is wrecked. It can't help. <coughs> You can't rely on the government balance sheet. Second balance sheet, household balance sheet. You need your consumers to be wealthy. You need them to have savings, and then they can go shopping. Our household balance sheet is wrecked. We don't have a huge amount of savings, a huge amount of wealth. The third balance sheet is your corporate balance sheet. And it turns out, miraculously, South Africa has an incredibly strong corporate balance sheet that is well managed. Thank goodness. Therefore, the solution is leverage the one remaining balance sheet. Make that balance sheet work hard. In other words, get this money to work hard. Will this money work hard? Yes. But it's got to have the right conditions. It's got to feel confident. So, if I'm proposing a solution to government, what is my solution? Very simple. 
My solution is public-private partnerships. How does that work? It simply says this. Business lacks confidence, but has money. Government has confidence, hmm, but lacks money. In other words, if you say business, business doesn't have the confidence but has the money, let's put that together with, with government. Government decides what project. Government wants stuff, right? Government, let's pick water. I pick water treatment. Have you been to Kimberley lately? Like, don't drink the water. So let's say you go to a small town. Many small towns have this problem. And the small town has got a water problem. Either no water or water that's not fit for human consumption. How about this as a solution? You go to the private sector and you say to the private sector, you fix the water. You take your balance sheet, your money, and you fix the water. You run the water. And in return, I'm going to pay you a fee for the water, not a profit. You can't charge what you want for that water. You will charge a regulated fee. You've got to guarantee quality and you've got to guarantee quantity of water. Government still owns the water. They don't give up ownership. They simply give it to business to run it. Would business be interested? Yes. In our business, we've got an infrastructure division. A part of our business that goes around looking to invest in infrastructure. What's their problem? They've got more money than they need. What's the problem? They don't have projects. They constantly, where's a project we can invest in? They've got the money. <laughs> money is not the problem. Corporates have got the money. Pension funds have got the money. What they're looking for is the right purpose. Business go, government goes to them and says, invest in water. Business will jump at it. What's in it for government? Government gets the water revitalized. That helps to lift confidence in Kimberley. Government runs around Kimberley telling everybody, vote for the ANC, I gave you water. Will that work? Oh, yes. <laughs> who loses? In that scenario, who's lost? Only the person who wants to take the bribe on the contract. Other than that, nobody's lost. <laughs> so why don't we do it? I don't know. But that is the type of thing we've got to look at. And to me, if we look at those sorts of things, we start to make progress. If we're not willing to do that, South Africa's stuck. It's stuck in a growth rate of less than half a percent. So under those sort of circumstances, what are the investment thoughts? Ultimately, you've got to invest your money. There are two thoughts I want to leave you with. Two overriding thoughts. First thought, you have to have offshore money. When you look at that first chart I showed you, now, I'm going to try to go to the beginning, which I don't know how to do on this computer. That's, that's impressive. Look at that. So, let's say that you are living in South Africa and you don't have offshore money. What are you actually saying? You're saying that every best investment opportunity in the world is concentrated in that 0.4% of world GDP. And that in the other 99.6% of the world, there's nothing to invest in. It's all in this little universe, and that's what I'm using. That would be naive. Surely, in the other 99.6% of the world, there are a couple of investments that might be useful, right? And it turns out there is. And there are many funds that, that I think do a stunning job. Stanlove's got a fund that does exceptionally well internationally. Managing money in equities internationally. Please, I'm urging you. You can't sit. You can sit in the 0.4%. But don't sit with all your cash, with all your investments in the 0.4%. It's massively concentrated as a risk. There are lots of opportunities out there. The second thing that I think I want to leave you with is that if you have money in South Africa, and you have to, you live here. Where should you have that money? Think about this. How much do you get out of a government bond? How much do you get out of investing in a bond? Governments wreck, but they pay their bills. Stunning return. 
In fact, foreigners love that. If you invest in a US government bond, what's your return? A US government bond, what return do you get? One and a half percent. Uh, we'll look at it in quite a lot of detail. I analyze the US a huge amount. Uh, the reason is that there's a massive impact on our South African markets, whether we like it or not. I keep saying, but a tweet from Trump has more impact on our markets than a state of the nation address from Cyril. And uh, you might think that's odd, but that's just the way it is, the way in which our markets uh, react. So understanding the US, understanding what's happening in Europe, elsewhere around the world, understanding uh, the coronavirus is quite, quite key to how our markets perform. And obviously over time, our markets don't necessarily always reflect the South African economy. At times, they can disconnect quite substantially, and I think that's probably good. Mm. Uh, so we'll talk about the U.S., and then we'll talk about South 7%. It has a very young population, and therefore has a lot of potential. Having potential doesn't mean that you realize it. It just means that you could do better, and India would be right at the top. And then clearly, Sub-Saharan Africa in general has a young population and so could be more prosperous. There's a lot of attention on Sub-Saharan Africa and India as the future prospects, uh, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Okay, so that's more or less the composition of the, of the world. Obviously, having said that, I'm gonna spend a huge amount of time talking about the 0.4% on the, on the chart. <laughs> so there we go, 0.4. I kind of, I, I keep rounding that up. Um, Mostly just so I feel better. Uh, it's terrible to think of it as 0.3. But the other day I was in Namibia and I put up this chart. And then the guy, one of the guys in the audience, I could see his mind working, saying, Ooh, I wonder how big Namibia is. <laughs> so he put up his hand and he said, How big is Namibia? And I instantly felt sad for him because I think wherever you are, you think you're at the center of the universe, right? You are what's most important in the world and everything else doesn't matter. And it turns out that Namibia is 0.01% of the world. Yeah, I did round that up for his benefit. <laughs> okay, so some of these economies are quite small on a global scale, but we need to understand South Africa, we live here, we hope it does better. Uh, so I need to give you an idea of what's happening here. Okay, so that's the world. What's inflation in the US? 2%. Inflation's 2%. You're getting a return of 1.5%. What's your real return? Investing in government bonds in the US, minus half a percent. If you invest in a 10 year bond in Germany, Germany runs well, their government runs well, invest in them. What are you going to get as a return? Minus half a percent. Your starting return is minus. And people invest in that. They go to Germany and they say, here's my money, and I know in 10 years' time I'm going to get less, but here's my money. South African is giving you 8.5%. Is the South African government about to go bankrupt? No. Can they fund themselves? Yes. Is government under pressure? Yes. But do they pay their bills? Yes. 8.5% is a stunning return relative to inflation. Now you say to yourself, okay, wait, 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 wait. I don't want to invest in a government bond. I want something a bit more secure. Not a problem. Go into something called an income fund. An income fund is simply similar to a government bond, but it's much closer, much at the short end of the yield curve. And they don't generally invest in government. They invest in banks. Short-dated instruments. And where your return is now, instead of being eight and a half, it's more like seven and a half, eight. Solid return. What's the risk? Negligible. <laughs> Which means a lot, of, a lot of people are rushing off and putting their money in the bank account. Oh, no, don't do that. Bank account is not a good idea. You're simply not going to get the return that you want. My advice is, if you're really nervous, short end of the yield curve, income funds, much better return in real terms. So it's not as if there aren't investment options in South Africa, there are. And there are investment options outside.
the whole thing. Isaac Newton said, I can calculate the motion of the heavenly bodies, but not the madness of the people. And I think that's the psychology that we're talking about. Why on earth would we be buying all these dollars when they're just printing? Zimbabwe did it, and they were bankrupt, and they had hyperinflation, and guess what? The Americans do it, and it seems okay. I guess it's all about confidence, belief, and trust, isn't it? And I guess that's why... That's what the financial services industry is about. When you put your money in a bank, or you buy a gold coin or anything, you want to believe you're going to get your money back. And that's our job. Our job as independent advisors is to go out there and look at all the risks, that four-letter word risk, and we've got to go out and look at that risk, and we've got to look at you as the client, our family of investors, as we call you. In the office, you are known as our family of investors. We always say, if that was my father or my brother or my cousin, my aunt, how would I want to be treated? And we want to share that knowledge with you and disseminate that knowledge, how, how, which uh, obviously Kevin's done, in meaningful bite-sized chunks. So being independent is hugely important. So for those new people in the audience, we are 100% independent. In other words, we're not owned by anything. And then we ask ourselves three questions in the audience. Because every morning we wake up, I feel like something like, it's like Groundhog Day, repeat, repetitive process. Do you remember Groundhog Day? That movie, I thought it was a classic with Bill Murray. But I ask, every morning I think to myself, what do I need, what do I want, and what is my cash flow? Number one thing, of course, my main need is be healthy. Nothing matters, if you're healthy, everything's cool. My family and friends, are they okay? And then of course, money. Money doesn't buy happiness, but it helps. Okay. That's what I say to myself. And you need this thing called bloody cash flow. Okay, so I'm going to talk about cash flow today. And I'm going to talk about it in a very user-friendly way. Like Kevin did, I'm going to try and make some sense of a big conundrum. It's called the retirement conundrum. And I'm working with the Financial <coughs> Services Product Authority with our, uh, Derek Smorenberg about finding solutions uh, to the, particularly the retired audience, about making sure their money lasts as long as they do. Okay, let's see what happens. So you go to work, off you go, and you accumulate capital, and then one day, you wake up, or unless you're in America, because you never retire, you're 70 years old, and you're still working. I have an aunt who's 81, who's a newspaper editor, by the way. 81, Rose Chinnery. Uh, I think my mom would still be working if she could. And uh, there she has it, she, she has to distribute income. She needs money, she needs income distribution. She was working, she accumulated her capital, now she's gonna need to have this distributed. Now, I don't know how long we're all going to last. I know that uh, statistically, we've got a few actuaries in the audience. We'll roughly estimate that the average person, God willing, is going to last about another 20 years from retirement. That's roughly the statistics. Uh, and we've got two actuaries to verify that in the audience. And typically, you can expect to live that long when you retire from the age of 60, certainly in the context of this room. So there you are, of course, different countries have different population dynamics. That's another story. So there you are, you plant your little seed, and then you are, become a 30-year-old, and before you know it, you're growing there, your money's growing, you grow a little bit of money, you put a little bit of money away, the money's represented by the apples. Everyone understands apples and pears, right? So I decided I'll just use apples today. So we're gonna be, we're gonna be investment farmers today. I'm talking to some farmers tomorrow. In fact, Kevin and I are flying down to Natal tomorrow where there are some farmers that actually got a land claim and they're getting paid 804 million rand tomorrow. So we're going to have a cup of uh, maybe a bigger Brandevein Matilla and see what happens there. Anyway, there we are. There's a 40-year-old and then you plant a few more apples and so forth. And then suddenly this miraculous age 60 roughly arrives, 60, 65. And you say, gee, I've now retired. Now what I'm going to do and you've got all these little apples on your tree, you've hopefully saved and you've been very diligent and you've got now this money. And now you hopefully live to about 80 years old, hopefully. Okay, so if you're healthy and you go to gym and you do aerobics and you become a vegan and you do all the right things, you're gonna be okay. Of course, if you're heading back, if you are eating red meat and all that, I watched this diet program. What's this new fad diet program we're watching, Tracy? Game changer. The game changer. Everyone watch that. I've just stopped eating meat immediately now. I'm just <laughs> eating carrots and celery. In fact, Ed is driving me mad. I go to fruits and roots now. So I don't go to a spur or anything now. I've moved on to my 20s and I'm now going to fruits and roots and eating green guru juice. It's delicious. 
<laughs> and dry carrot cake. And my chocolate has no more sugar in and I don't drink coffee with sugar because all you guys come to my office and I don't take sugar anymore. So we're saving a lot of money on sugar as well. So well done. No, I don't take, I have, and I have my, all my clients are now having black coffee as well. They don't have milk because milk's got hormones and all these things. So you're going to live longer as well. That's all good news. So there's your apple tree. There it is. Okay, so you've grown it well done. And you've reached 80, but it doesn't look as rosy as that apple tree. It's not all rosy because what starts to happen is you invest your capital, you will see, this is pure coincidence, you talked about the guy gardening, hey? Because there he's gardening away and he puts his little seed there, doesn't realize there's a Roman coin noch all there, maybe the missing Kruger millions or something. You invest your capital, the fruits of your labor as we like to put it, and off you go, you grow your investment. Uh, let me just go back to emphasize the point. This is a very important point. You see on the right hand side of the graph, fortunately we stuck behind this uh, microphone here, yeah, being a bit ADD, I need to walk around, but I'm stuck behind this thing now. And say so you're drawing 6%, and you're getting a yield of 3%. Where did I get that 3%? Where did I just take this figure out of nowhere? I'm working on roughly what the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, that 0.4% Kevin talked about, is going to give us. Okay, roughly about 3 to 4%. So let's, let's look at what that little apple tree was doing. Let's, that you get, let's look at all the apples over one year, three years, five years, seven years, and ten years. Your fruits of your labor, you put your money into the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. You put it into that 0.4%. And you're going to get, with dividends, about a 12% return. That sounds bloody nice. Wow. And then you look over three years, and you get, with dividends, a 742 and in year five, about just under 6%. And over seven years, about 877 and it looks very nice at about 10 years, about 10.7. I would love to get 10.78 right now. If I were a bet, if I could lock in a 10% net return, I would take that and run if I could. 